Uh, yeah, I'll try anything once, right? Uh, but I want to thank you for coming too, and I am Jennifer Farr Davis, and um, I am way more than a cook or a tennis player or a beauty pageant contestant. I am a hiker, um, and I've actually hiked over 12,000 miles on six different continents. So which continent have I not been to? That's right. I don't do cold weather, so I have not been to Antarctica. Um, but out of all the places where I have hiked and I have traveled, the trail that means the most to me and the trail that has changed my life the most is the Appalachian Trail. And I've actually done the entire 2,185 mile Appalachian Trail three separate times. Yeah. And it was the most recent time in uh, 2011 where with my husband's help, with Bruce's help, we set the overall record for both men and women. So for 46 straight days, I averaged 47 miles a day. And y'all are all looking at me like I'm crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll admit it is a little crazy. Um, but hopefully we can all agree that a journey of any distance or any speed always has to start with a single step, right? And my first step into the wilderness took place when I was 21 years old. I had just graduated from college, and before I started what I thought would be a traditional 30-year career, well, I wanted to have just one adventure. And growing up in North Carolina, I had heard about the Appalachian Trail. And uh, I didn't know much about it. In fact, I had never set foot on it before. At that point in my life, I had only spent two nights in the woods my entire life. But yeah. At age 21, that doesn't matter, right? Because I thought I knew everything. I thought I could do anything. And so with my small knowledge of the Appalachian Trail, I waited a few months after graduating in December, and then I started in Georgia with my brother's old Boy Scout gear and the goal of walking all the way to Maine. And, uh, and I thought the Appalachian Trail was going to be an adventure. And it, it was, I mean, it was an adventure, but I also thought that hiking the Appalachian Trail was going to be fun. And there were times when it was fun. But I learned very quickly that walking, at least walking on the Appalachian Trail, was the hardest thing I had ever done in my entire life. But looking back even today, that first five-month journey on the Appalachian Trail, it was the best five months of my entire life. And that's because when I got to the end, I was a completely different person. And thankfully, I liked the woman at the end a whole lot more than the girl who had started. And because of the trail, my values had changed. I mean, I could stay up here all night and tell you lessons that I learned and memories that I made and experiences I had on that first journey. But I'm not going to do that because I want you to read about them. Uh, I want you to read about them in my first book, but also we don't have all night. And so um, I basically need to sum it up for you so we can get to the story about the record. And uh, I'm going to sum up my transformation by reading a short passage from my first book, which is called Becoming Odessa. And right now, probably all you guys are wondering, what is an Odessa, right? Just so you know, Odessa is my trail name. And it's really common when you hike a long distance trail that you take a nickname while you're out there that's called a trail name. And I know we have some trail names in here. And I'm going to ask once again, is anyone willing to share their nickname? What is it? Wine and Dine. That sounds like a delightful trail name. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. I, I, you know, I have, a, I have a trail friend called Hangry because she's always hungry and angry at the same time, so there's Hangry. Um, I know we have a NASA. I know we have an Insomner. What are you? Unisomer. Unisomner. A trippy experience with a sleeping pill, right? That was it. Because it's partner snores. Any other trail names in here? Well, trail names are a real fun tradition, and 
my first week on the Appalachian Trail, you know, all the other hikers are trying to give everyone a trail name. And so folks all told me that I should be slim or stretch or slinky because I was six feet tall. And I had absolutely no desire to relive middle school for another six months. So finally, because I was a big dork and I was comparing um, the trail to Homer's Odyssey, another hiker said, hey, what about the trail name Odysseus? And I thought, you know what? I really like that, but I'm proud to be a woman out here and I want a feminine trail name. So we changed Odysseus to Odessa and I've been Odessa ever since. So here's a passage from the last full day, so we're all the way up in Maine, the last full day of Odessa's first journey. When people had asked why I wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail, one of the answers I had given was that I wanted time to think about where I wanted to live and what I wanted to do for a living. And the trail would give me plenty of time to do that. But now that I was at the end, I didn't feel any closer to knowing the answers than when I started. The only thing I felt more certain of at the end of this journey was myself. I was no longer defined by my resume or my activities, and I didn't give answers based on what I thought other people wanted to hear. For the first time in my life, I knew who I was, and I was okay with who I was. I definitely believed in God, and for the first time in my life, I didn't feel like I needed to hide that or apologize for it, because my affection for other hikers and their acceptance of me helped me realize that regardless of faith and background, if you get to know people, not what they are, but who they are, then you will experience love and friendship you might otherwise have missed. I also knew that something deep within me connected with nature and with hard work and with simplicity. I learned that I was both stubborn and tough, a lot tougher than I thought I was, and especially when I let other people help me. Now, <clears throat> when it was all said and done, I got off the trail and I got a job. I mean, much to my mother's relief, I got a job. And it was actually a really good job, and I was working with fun people, and so I think everything said that I should have been happy. I should have been content. But then as the weeks started to pass, and then the months started to pass, all I could think about was the trail. And I missed it. I mean, I missed it so bad that it hurt inside. I missed the adventure. I missed moving. I mean, my job was great, but I basically sat behind a computer for eight hours a day. I missed my friends. It was the first time in my life where I really, truly had friends who were very different from me. And surprisingly, even though I went out there terrified that I was going to be bored and lonely, I came off the trail and I longed for the silence and the solitude. But the thing I miss most of all, well, it's really hard to explain, and it sort of doesn't make sense, because the thing I miss most of all was how beautiful I felt on the trail. And that absolutely, positively does not make sense, because when I was on the trail, I was dirty. I mean, I looked like this girl. Look, stand up. <laughs> I looked like her, covered in mud. That's exactly what I looked like, dirty. <laughs> And I smelled way worse than she did. And I also had bug bites and scrapes and bruises covering my body. But for five months, I didn't have a mirror. And I always have to clarify for the younger crowd, this is before the day of the cell phone selfie. So I wasn't doing that every day either. I really didn't see my reflection except through my interaction with other people. So if I was kind or funny, if I made someone else smile, that made me feel pretty. And growing up, I always thought that nature was beautiful. And we can probably all agree that nature is beautiful, right? But I had never really seen myself as a part of nature and a part of that beauty until I hiked the trail. 
And finally, after walking 2,185 miles, well, you better believe I based my self-worth a whole lot less on how I looked and a whole lot more on what I could do. And maybe that was the biggest gift the trail gave me. It made me realize I could do so much more than I once thought was possible, both on and off the trail. And around that time, I started saving up money from work, started saving up time away from work, and I started to plan my next long distance hike. And for several years, I just fell into a routine of working and then hiking and working and hiking and working and hiking. And one of the best parts about being a hiker is that there are trails everywhere. I mean, really everywhere, all over the US, all over the world, and in my opinion, they're most, the most affordable, and that's hard to argue, they are the most affordable, the most accessible, and the best way to travel. And I'm actually going to take a minute and share with you guys some of my favorite pictures from different long-distance hiking trails all over the world. I'll sort of tell you where they're from, too, while it's going. So I think we start in Africa on Mount Kilimanjaro. This is on a 600-mile trail in Australia called the Bibbleman Track. This is in Peru. That hurt. <laughs> This is on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. And this is on the Pacific Crest Trail, which runs from Mexico to Canada. All the rest are from Europe. So you guys like those pictures? <clears throat> well, as you can see, the trail was taking me to some pretty incredible places. And so by the time I was just 25, I pretty much admitted that I had a problem. I mean, I was a hiker. That was where all my time and all my money went. It went to the trail. And so at that point, I actually quit my day job to start my own hiking company. 
because I wanted to get other people outdoors and I wanted to do it through writing and through speaking and also through guiding. But of course, I still wanted to hike a little on my own too. And I was sort of starting to plan out my next long distance adventure when all of a sudden something happened that I thought might ruin everything. I'm starting to notice this trend. I've been saying that recently, and whenever I do, all the women look back at me and smile. And I want to know, like, the guys are like, really, what happened? And all the women look back and smile, nod their head. So y'all know um, I fell in love, and I got engaged, and I was convinced that, you know, at the time in my life when I was ready to be married, well, I need to be ready to settle down or at least just slow down. Yeah. But I was really fortunate to, uh, to find a guy who loves me for me, which is the hiker, and he is pretty supportive most of the time. Uh, but maybe most important of all, I ended up marrying a fellow who was a public school teacher. So what does that mean? Summer's off and lots of money, right? No, 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 no. Just summer's off. But it, that was good. We had summer's off. And so we could still have adventures together. And, uh, you know, I had told Brew, my husband, I told Brew on our very first date that I wanted to hike the entire Appalachian Trail again for the second time. And as much as he loved me, even after we were engaged, he still did not want to hike 2,185 miles with me. So we got to this point where we were talking about how I could hike, but how we could also spend time together. And we came up with the idea of doing a supported hike. And a supported hike takes a really long trail like the AT, and it basically turns it into a series of day hikes. Because now, instead of carrying my big heavy pack with my tent and my sleeping bag and several days worth of food, well, now all I had to carry was a day pack with just the items required to reach the next road crossing. Because at every road crossing, there would be my husband. And what else would be there? Food, gear, supplies, our car, right? It was a road crossing. Our car was there so I could get whatever I wanted, but just what I needed to reach the following road. So as soon as we decided that we were going to complete the trail in that manner, well, I decided that I wanted to try and establish a women's record on the Appalachian Trail. Because as long as I had heard about supported hikes, not all of them, but a good number of them had been in regards to records, people trying to go very quickly. But every record I had ever heard of on the Appalachian Trail belonged to a man. And I am all about some girl power. <laughs> so I thought there should be a women's record too. And there really wasn't one. So I knew if we were smart and if I stayed healthy, we would probably accomplish our goal. So on June 8, 2008, Brew and I were married. And then just 12 days later, we started, this time not down in Georgia, this time I started up in Maine. And we began to work our way southbound and talk about a honeymoon, right? If you ever really want to work on communication, then I highly recommend the Appalachian Trail. But after just 57 days of working together and being a team, we made it to Springer Mountain, Georgia. And we accomplished our goal. I had established a women's record, and along the way, I averaged 38 miles a day. And that's not too shabby, right? I mean, it had been tough. It had been really tough. But I was surprised at how much I loved it. And looking back, I should have loved it. I mean, really, I should have. Because there I was that summer, a newlywed on cloud nine. I was out there on my absolute favorite trail, doing exactly what I loved all day, every day. And the man who I loved more than anyone was running all of my errands. I mean, all of them, every single one. What was not to love? But when we got to the end, Brew and I hiked up to the top of Springer Mountain together. And on the summit, there's a rock with a plaque that represents the end. 
so we went up to it and we both put our hands on it. And as soon as we did, I turned to him just grinning from ear to ear. And he turned to me and he said, we are never doing that again. <laughs> And he meant it, too. I promise you that. He meant it. Um, <laughs> but there was just one small problem. You see, we hiked off that mountain, and I knew that I could have kept going. And before that summer, when I thought about exploration or adventure, I thought about going new places and seeing new things. But after that summer, when I thought about exploration, all I wanted to explore were my own limits. I wanted to try and find my potential. And I hadn't found that, not yet. I mean, I still had something left at the end of that journey, and I also now had the knowledge that when you're trying to set a record on the Appalachian Trail, it has very little to do with speed or strength or even gender. What do you think it's all about? Consistency, that's huge. What else? Endurance, mental toughness. What else, what else? There's a lot of right answers. I like to know what you're gonna say. Support, did I hear that? Support is at least 50% of it. I mean, think about it. If the person you helping you along the way, if they miss you at one point, that could be the end of the record. Support is so important, so is strategy. So is training, knowing the trail, knowing your body, um, good weather. <laughs> I mean, good weather goes a long way on a record attempt. But given those factors, well, now there is this small voice inside of me that said, I might have what it would take to set the overall record. But I took that voice and out of respect for my husband, I buried it down deep. And I figured it would just go away. <laughs> so the next few summers, Brew and I agreed to hike much shorter trails. And when I say shorter, I'm talking about 500 miles. So very reasonable. We hike much shorter trails at a much slower pace. And we hike side by side. And it was so much fun. I mean, we went out and did the Colorado Trail together, which stretches from Denver to Durango. And it was awesome. And then to top that, the next summer we went over and did 500 miles together in Europe, and it was incredible. But what do you think happened to that small voice? Yeah, yeah. It did not go away. It grew louder. It grew stronger. And it got to the point where I knew there were only two options. Either we would go back and we would try for the overall record, or else I would always look back. And I would always wonder what might have been. And I didn't want to look back, and I didn't want to wonder. So I sat down with my husband, and we had a talk. And I used every bargaining chip I could think of, um, which at that point in our marriage included um, some football game tickets and future offspring and really good beer. <laughs> And by the end of that conversation, he agreed to help me one more time. So in the summer of 2011, we went back to the Appalachian Trail. And we went back up to Maine. Why do you guys think we wanted to start in Maine and not down in Georgia? Did you say downhill? I mean, I want to clarify, it is not downhill. We all know that, right? It is not downhill from Maine to Georgia. Um, but the real reason we wanted to start up in Maine is because I wanted to get through the hardest part of the trail in the beginning. And the hardest two states are Maine and New Hampshire. And I also wanted to do that terrain with the longest daylight hours of the year. So that's why we started up in Maine in mid-June. And for the first few days, everything went about how we thought it would. Now from day one, I was tired and I was sore and I hurt because day one was a 60 mile day. And five of those miles don't even count because you have to hike to the top of Katahdin before you touch the sign and actually start the trail. But I was learning very quickly that you never really hike the same trail more than once. 
I mean, this was my third time on the AT, but in just a few days, I was going through places where before maybe I had rain or fog, but this time I got there and there was just an incredible view. And I had no clue it was there. And I loved that. And this summer, I started every morning in the dark. And I ended every night in the dark. And that was scary. I mean, it didn't bother me so much in the morning, but at night, hiking by myself on the rocks in Maine, that was a little scary. But in just three days, I saw more moose than I had on any of my other hikes. And I saw a ton of wildlife that summer. And it's not hard to figure out why, is it? I was out when the animals were out. And I was out when the other hikers were still out their tents or in the shelters. And so again, for the most part, everything went about how we thought it would until day five. And on day five, I was hiking up this really steep mountain in Maine. And on my way to the summit, I started to feel a really sharp pain between my knee and my ankle and my right leg. When I finally got up to the ridge line, I was in so much pain that I had to put all my weight on the other side of my body and just limp along until the exact same pain that was in my right leg developed in my left leg. And within three hours, I had full-blown shin splints. I can always look out and tell exactly who has had shin splints because they grimace like it's the worst thing ever because it's the worst thing ever. I mean, seriously, if you've had them, you know that going uphill is excruciating, but going downhill is unbearable. There were times on my descent where I would plant my foot and my leg would buckle beneath me because of the pain and I would fall, I mean literally collapse down to the trail. I didn't want to quit if I didn't have to. And a big part of me thought, I might have to quit. But another part of me thought that my injury had been caused by the high mileage days on the rocks up in Maine. I actually trained for an entire year leading up to the record, but I trained almost entirely down south where we have a lot of nice dirt trails. And up in Maine and up in New Hampshire, there's a lot of exposed and unforgiving granite rock. But if I could just get to Vermont, has anyone in here hiked in Vermont? <laughs> Do you guys call it Vermud? Is that what you call it? There are a lot of hikers who actually refer to Vermont as Vermud because once you get there, usually you are walking through about a foot of mud. But I thought if I could make it there, maybe at least it'd be soft enough to where my legs could heal. So now all I had to do was make it through New Hampshire to get there. Yeah, easier said than done, right? Uh, <laughs> and actually, I'll back up a minute because, you know, I was still in Maine trying to get to New Hampshire. And I think at that point, I had about a half dozen mountain summits left. And every time I made it to the top of one of those mountains, I was forced to turn around and then hike or scramble downhill backwards. And no one once stopped and asked, hey, are you that girl who's trying to set the record? <laughs> no. But at one point, I straight up got asked if I was lost or confused. <laughs> okay. um, but I have no doubt it is only because I was willing to hike backwards that I even made it to New Hampshire. And if there is one state on the entire trail where I wake up in the morning and I just pray for good weather, it's in New Hampshire. And when I got there, I had about 24 hours of decent weather. And then I was going up the slopes of Mount Washington. And Mount Washington is not only one of the highest peaks on the Appalachian Trail, but at one point, Mount Washington had the highest recorded wind speed of any place on the planet. The weather on that mountain is actually so severe that they built a weather station on top of the mountain to study the weather patterns up there. And sure enough, as soon as I got above treeline on Mount Washington, 
that wind picked up, and then the clouds rolled in, and then the rain, the rain started to fall. And for the next 36 hours, I was just hiking through a torrential downpour until it finally changed. You see, it changed the last week of June when I got up to another high ridge line, and now after a day and a half straight of cold rain, now I was in the middle of a sleet storm. And I thought I was prepared. I mean, that's part of what made it so frustrating. If I had come to pack and paddle and said, what do I need for a summer hike in the White Mountains? I had all that stuff. I had great gear. I had a long wolf, long sleeve base layer. I had a rain jacket. I had a warm hat. I had extra snacks. They were all frozen, but I had extra snacks. And none of it seemed to matter. Because after a day and a half straight of cold rain, I was soaking wet, and I was shivering, and I felt like I was starving, and now I was in the middle of a sleet storm. So I wanted to do something, anything to take my mind off the conditions and off of how I felt. So I started to sing out loud. Some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy, but there are a lot of long distance hikers who like to sing out loud. And it is especially fun for me because I have a horrible voice. It's really bad, and I will not demonstrate. But if there's any good part about being on a 6,000-foot ridge in a sleet storm, it's that you can sing as loud as you want, and no one cares. So there I was. I started belting out my favorite song that summer. But from the very beginning, I was just slurring the song. I mean, I was mum, 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 mumbling all the words. And oh yeah, I was tripping like every five or six steps. And finally I acknowledged what deep down I already knew. And what was that? I was hypothermic. I was moderately hypothermic and it was becoming a lot worse very quickly. And you know, it's a really strange thing when you're dealing with hypothermia because as long as you can think clearly, which that starts to go too, but as long as you can think clearly, you know you got to get someplace warm and dry. But all your body wants to do, I mean all your body starts to do, is just shut down. And so all I wanted to do was curl up into a ball and stay there and just shiver. But I only let myself pause once. And that was to take off my pack and see if there was anything else I could put on. And I found a trash bag that was keeping a few items dry. So I poked a hole for my head and two for my arms, put it on my body. And then I brought out my spare set of socks. And what do you think I did with my socks? Made them into mittens, right? And then I just kept marching. But by the time I made it to the base of that mountain, I was so cold and I was so stiff that I could barely bend my joints. My lips were bright blue, and I kid you not, I looked like Frankenstein's monster. I mean, this is how I was hiking. But my husband knew there had been bad weather. So he hiked into the base of the mountain in the middle of the day, and he set up our tent, and as soon as I saw it, I got inside. But I was so rigid, I couldn't even undress myself. He had to help me out of cold, wet clothes and into two sleeping bags, and for the next 30 minutes, I just laid there and I just shivered because that was all I could do. But when I finally started to relax just a little bit, what do you think I wanted to do next? Any ideas? I didn't want to hike yet. First, oh my gosh, I ate and I ate and I ate every crumb inside that tent. And in 20 minutes, I consumed over 3,000 calories. And I know that because all I did was shove food in my mouth and all my husband did was tally up the wrappers that I was throwing to the wayside. <laughs> so in 20 minutes, I consumed over 3,000 calories. And at that point, all I wanted to do was hike. Talk about a sugar rush, right? <laughs> all I wanted to do was get back on the trail. And, uh, you know, my husband, uh, <clears throat> he was so thoughtful. And we actually joked about it that summer. I always told him his job description that summer was really simple because his only job was to think of everything. That was all I asked. 
And he was so good at it. He had packed in the tent. He had brought in all that food. He even remembered extra clothes. So there I was in the tent. I put on a warm fleece and a dry rain jacket and fresh socks. And fresh socks are like the best thing ever when you're a hiker. But as I was looking around the tent, I soon realized there was not an extra set of shorts or an extra pair of pants. So I turned to the corner of the tent where my cold, wet, icy shorts sat in the middle of a puddle. <sighs> and then I turned to my husband. And I glanced back at the puddle, and I glanced back at my husband, and I said, I want your shorts. <laughs> yeah. And this is so my husband, uh, because he didn't disagree, he didn't bat an eye, but he did look straight back at me and he said, ask nicely, you know, <laughs> like, you got to have standards out there, you got to have some dignity. So I did, and I, I got his shorts, and as a side note, it was the last week of June, and he was wearing the Grinch that stole Christmas boxers. I mean, it was absurd. But I tell that story, because at the end, um, I think it's clear. I mean, I, I hope that it is clear that it was my husband's support which always allowed me to keep going. And it wasn't just my husband. I mean, we had friends and family members and hikers and runners who came out here and there and helped us along the way. But my husband was the only person who was with me from the beginning to the end. And I'm pretty sure he's the only person who could have put up with me from the beginning to the end. And when I think about our record, I know it has more to do with his support and his unselfishness than it does with my athleticism. And I'm convinced that I would have quit without him. Because the first day we got to Vermont, that one state where everything was supposed to get better, the first day in Vermont was the worst day of the entire summer. The stress of the shin splints, which were worse than ever, combined with the after effects of the hypothermia, which were really weird, combined with all those back-to-back-to-back high-mileage days, I mean, it was just too much. And I got sick, really sick. And that is never fun. I mean, that's not fun when you're at home. But it is especially not fun when you're on the trail. And the type of sick I had, I wasn't even on the trail. You know what I'm saying? I was running off trail every few minutes. And I was becoming even more depleted and pretty severely dehydrated. And you know, when I started that summer, I had done the math. I knew that I would have to average over 46 miles a day to break the record. Here we were on day 12. I was averaging 38 miles a day. And now I couldn't even go one mile per hour. So I quit. I told myself I'd just make it to that next road crossing, and when I got there, we were going home. When I finally arrived, Brew was there waiting for me, and so I told him how sick I was, and I told him how much I hurt, and I told him that we were finished with the record. And this is so not my husband. Because he does not like to see me in pain, and he does not like to run my errands all day either. But he looked straight back at me, and he basically said, suck it up. And still, when I tell that story, I get a little angry. I mean, I get a little mad when I tell it. But the truth is, when it actually happened, I was just shocked. I mean, I was so taken back. I never thought he would disagree with me when I said it was done. But when I finally tuned in and listened to what he had to say, he told me that if I really wanted to quit, if that was truly what I wanted, that was fine. But I just couldn't quit right then. He looked at me and he said, right now I think you feel too bad to make a good decision. So right now you got to eat and drink and take medicine and you got to keep hiking. And in 48 hours, if you still want to quit, we'll go home. I left that road crossing counting the minutes and the miles 
until I could officially stop. But after the 12 hardest miles that I have ever known, I started to feel a little bit better. I mean, just a hair. When I felt the slightest bit better, no part of me thought that I could set the record on the Appalachian Trail. But I was reminded that my ultimate goal that summer was to discover my best on the Appalachian Trail. And so at that point, I no longer wanted to get off the trail. I wanted to keep going, and I wanted to just see what would happen. And I learned, it's amazing what can happen when you're just willing to see what can happen. Because after that moment, things never got worse. <laughs> things never got a whole lot better, but things never got worse. And I'll never forget, you know, <laughs> about halfway through that summer, we made it um, to Pennsylvania on the rocks, the rocks of Pennsylvania. And so I was walking and another hiker came out to join me for a stretch and he had done the entire trail in the past a couple of times. So we were walking and we were talking and midway through our conversation, he looks at me and he asks, are you even having fun out here? Are you even having fun? And I looked at him and I said, no. I said, no, I'm not having fun out here, but I think this might be better than fun. And I'm not sure I knew what I meant when I said it because you know, it was night hiking on the rocks of Pennsylvania and I was exhausted, but looking back, I'm pretty sure I was trying to convey the fact that in my life, the things that have meant the most to me, the things that have been the most rewarding and the most fulfilling, they've been the things that I've had to work for. And they have been challenging and they have been difficult and they have forced me to grow. And on the trail that summer, I wasn't having a whole lot of fun. But every morning I woke up with this strong sense of purpose. And I woke up with the joy of knowing that I was getting to live my dream. That is a very rare thing. And after 46 days, 11 hours, and 20 minutes, we made it to Springer Mountain, Georgia. And we did what almost everyone thought was impossible, and at times what I thought was impossible, we set the overall record for men and women, and this time along the way, we averaged 46.93 miles a day. But we didn't do it like the record setters of the past, which I think is pretty cool. We didn't run. Instead, I woke up every morning at 4.45 a.m., and I got on the trail at 5, and then I hiked for 16 or 17 hours straight. So I was lucky to get six hours of sleep at night, and I was trying to consume over 6,000 calories a day and still losing weight. Oh, and in 46 days, I got to see 36 black bears. That's a new record for me. I was excited. Um, but when I got to the end, when I completed the Appalachian Trail for the third time, I was convinced that the value of the trail can never be found in the numbers. I mean, not, a, not even on a record. Because the value of the trail will always be found, whether it's a day hike or a section hike or a through hike, it will always be found in the lessons that are learned and the memories that are made and the relationships that are formed. One of my favorite things about the Appalachian Trail record is that it is truly an amateur pursuit. It is based on the honor system, so when you finish, people can believe you or not believe you. And when you get to the end, there's no trophy. There's no check. There's not even a free t-shirt. I mean, there is nothing there. But that doesn't mean there isn't a reward. Um, and to wind down this evening, I'll actually read one more passage to you. And this is from my new book, Called Again, about the overall record. And it takes place at the end of the trail, but this time the other end, down in Georgia. And this will share a little bit of my reward with you. 
There we stood. We had beaten the previous record by 26 hours. I couldn't decide if 26 hours seemed like a fleeting moment or an eternity. I guess in the end it didn't matter. I had done my absolute best and this summer I could walk off this mountain never wondering what might have been. Looking out at the crowd that had gathered, our friends and family members who had hiked up Springer Mountain to greet us, it almost felt as if Brew and I were back at our wedding weekend. The people who meant the most to us were all there. There were pictures being taken and hugs being exchanged. Our friend Alice even remembered to bring up a bottle of champagne. This scene caused me to reminisce about our actual wedding ceremony. But coming to and looking out at the view on top of Springer Mountain, I think I preferred this occasion even more. You see, up here there was no pomp and circumstance, and Brew and I did not exchange traditional vows. Instead, we professed our love through the actions of the past 46 days. The trail brought to life a passage which had been read at our wedding, and it says, If I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, then I gain nothing. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I had never felt more in love with the wilderness or with my husband than I did on top of Springer Mountain. I did not want to leave, and this summer, I honestly did not think that I could. Thank you. So we're going to be kind of brief with this, but my favorite part of any talk is to do Q&A at the end. Um, and I know they have a ton of giveaways to, to hand out, so I'm not going to take that many questions, but I will take at least four or five. And I'll also, um, if my baby is behaving, invite my husband up, there she is, there he is, um, to join me. Obviously, this is our record, and so if y'all have, um, in our story, if y'all have questions for Brew, you can feel free to ask him too. And this is our um, daughter, Charlie. Say hello. Hello. She's a little too young for questions, but you know, whatever. She's she's part of the team, so feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. Or yeah. How many uh, miles per hour? In Maine and New Hampshire, um, I was lucky to be doing two. I feel like, and uh, you know, south of that, I was trying to do three or just over three miles per hour. Can I tell them the story about that? Yeah. So um, I got an email. story, we'd love to write something about it. Um, how much has been running? And at that time in Maine, New Hampshire, I said, well, she really hasn't run. She's been dealing with shin splints, and the terrain's really tough. And, and um, so she just hasn't run. She's been hiking. And then he emailed a couple, like, three weeks later, um, when we were, like, down in Virginia, and said, well, um, has she started running yet? And I said, no, she's still just hiking. <laughs> realized that she can get the miles in that she wanted to get and she didn't need to run and it's easier on her body and then a couple days later he wrote back and said well, well let me know if she ever runs <laughs> I'd love to write an article about her and uh, she finally so so I would joke with her when she'd come to road crossings and I'd say just run a few steps oh, yeah. get an article on her um, but she and she would just kind of laugh at me but then the very last day of the hike her brother who's like a New York City banker came out and with her, um, and he was the only thing that could get her to actually run. Yeah. He was just like egging her on as a big brother. Like, Trying to get away from my big brother more. caused me to actually so, run down the trail. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. You never went very fast. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's a great question. You know, it wasn't really until I was in college and started thinking about the Appalachian Trail. My parents had taken us on day hikes growing up, but I wasn't a big hiker or backpacker. I definitely wasn't a backpacker. I just played sports and was really into school and my friends, and I knew I liked to be active, and I knew I liked to be outdoors. And then this weird thing happens when college is over. 
you're not really active in outdoors anymore, you know, the way you are playing sports as a kid. So I wanted to find a different outlet and I wanted to have an adventure and the Appalachian Trail sounded like, you know, the perfect adventure. And it was in its own weird way, very hard way. Well, you two both get, yeah. <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> not, not for a record. I, mean, I promise Brew. No more records. Um, but Brew is actually the one working on a section hike of the Appalachian Trail right now. You know, when we had Charlie, we pretty much immediately became section hikers because we can't go out as long. Um, so he's working on a section hike of the Appalachian Trail, and I'm working on a section hike of the Continental Divide Trail. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah. Cheryl Strait. Right. Yeah. Well, I certainly think um you know, experience and knowledge can make you safer in the woods. So I would encourage you to link up with a local hiking group. Um, I know there's the Louisiana Hiking Club. Um, there's also one in Arkansas that I have heard people from here travel up to hike with them. And they take, like, international trips, and they take domestic, like, week-long backpacking trips. So I think really learning from other people in the beginning and feeling more confident and more comfortable in the woods and then, because I do love hiking on my own. I love hiking with Rue. I love hiking with other people, but there's something special about going out into the wilderness solo. But you know, I would say start slow, do it in a group, then go by yourself for a short period and then start to expand that as you feel comfortable, comfortable and confident. Um. I'm aware of wildlife. I'm aware of getting lost. I'm aware of my mortality and hypothermia and lightning storms. But statistically, I also know that I'm safer in the trail than I am in any major city in the US or probably the world. And I'm also safer statistically on the trail than I am driving to the trailhead. And Brew would tell you that's because I'm a horrible driver. But it's a, no, it's across the board. You're safer in the woods than you are, you know, driving down any road. So, you know, things even a, like... Even a good driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, Everything. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, I worried a lot. Um, I worried that something would happen to her. Um, I mean, I, you know, at first it was just like watching her sob. You know, yeah. she walked down the asphalt in Vermont, and, and she wouldn't stop. And I was like, just, just slow down or take some ads. Oh, I have to keep going. You know? <laughs> and, um, and then uh, I think also, like, when she was on Washington, we thought she would have cell phone reception and she didn't. So, you know, I worried then. Um, and then I also worried that it would be my fault if she messed up. Or if, if I wasn't a road stop. All right, one or two more questions. You and you, and yeah, then we'll wrap it up. Yes. I've not been bitten by a snake, and I've probably seen over a thousand. And uh, they really don't want anything to do with me. There have been times I've literally stepped on a snake because I didn't see it, um, and it didn't try to strike at me. Come very close to um, rattlers, which I actually prefer rattlesnakes over like copperheads because rattlesnakes actually tell you where they are, you know, which is sort of considerate. But um, <laughs> they. Uh, yeah, I started and I was definitely scared of bears and snakes. And now that I've seen so many, I don't have that same fear. I have a healthy respect of wildlife. But the animal I've had the most trouble with on trails are dogs off leash. And we have unruly dogs off leash in our neighborhoods, you know, so that's not going to keep me from going on the trail. I 
I would say on average 15. Um, I was going southbound and most people go north. So when I hit that herd of through hikers, I was seeing more than that every day. But there are also some places like farther down south where I might see, I don't know, three, four, five people a day just out for a day hike or a short stretch. So on average, probably 15. Um, and I love taking questions and I hope if y'all do have questions and I didn't call on you that you stick around and you hang out and you visit with us. Um, but I want to be respectful of people's times and I want y'all to win free swag, right? Um, so we're going to do a few more giveaways. Does that sound good? Okay.